Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome along to tonight's lecture. We are looking forward to a little bit of a different format tonight, which is exciting. We actually um, have four presenters for us tonight. We're looking, um, we're, first of all, we'll start off with Caleb, uh, and then we'll be moving uh, on to uh, Andrew and Taylor, who'll be presenting us something about conscientious objection. Then we'll be looking at um, Pete Jow, it's going to present something for us, and then we'll finish off the night with Luke. So obviously with the four speakers, we've got a slightly different uh, format. And the idea is for tonight is to um, work towards having something a little bit more uh, succinct and perhaps more easily consumed online. So tonight uh, we get to enjoy perhaps a little bit of sn snippets of th this and that, but also we are looking forward to be able to convert those snippets into short talks format presentation for use online on the website as well, and God willing. Now that also means that uh, we can enjoy those tonight, but we also have an opportunity to provide feedback to the speakers, so you know, they can take it or leave it, but the idea is we can uh, give them our thoughts and then perhaps take those thoughts and uh, adapt their, their presentations a little bit so that when we do the final recording, um, it might be, God willing, be even more improved. So what we'll do then is, as I said, we'll have those four speakers, and then after those, we'll reserve a few minutes. And I've got a microphone here as well that I can pass around the room as required, so those of us who are joining us online will also be able to provide those, uh, hear the feedback that's provided as well. So that's what we're looking forward to, but of course, with all things, we need to open with a word of prayer, and we are blessed to have our Father give us opportunities like this. So if you'll all rise, we'll, uh, we'll open the evening with a word of prayer. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for being able to approach you whenever we want to, and we ask you would help us to do that more often, that we'll build that relationship with you. And Lord God, we also realise we live in a world which is, has such a short attention span and we ourselves also are sometimes victims of this and so we, we appreciate, Father, that you try to communicate so much depth, so much wonder from your book, the Bible, and yet sometimes it's so hard for it to get through. And so we'd ask, Father, you'd be with the, the presenters tonight, that you would help them to find those, those nuggets and concentrate them into a format that will really strike home with each of us and with anyone who might hear in the future as well. We ask, Father, you'd help us to glorify your name in whatever way we can. And we ask you to help us to find the, the voice, find the, the message, find the format that really reaches to the people in this world so they too may hear the wonderful message, the wonderful hope that you've given to each of us. We ask, Father, tonight you'd help us to help these brothers as well to provide feedback with them. And Lord God, we ask also that these things may be useful to us, that we may learn something from this format, that we may learn something from our brothers who speak to us tonight, that we may be able to share that in our personal lives and in our personal interactions. And please give us the courage and the wisdom to share them going forward. And so we ask for your blessing on tonight and in all things we do and on this lampstand of yours in this city. All these things we ask for your son's name, the Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. All right, so as I mentioned tonight, we've got those four speakers and the first of those is Caleb. So I'd ask Brother Caleb, to come forward and, and give us his words on uh, what's happening in Belarus. Good evening, everyone. So, I guess one of the things that we care about a lot as Christadelphians is we care a lot about looking around the world and trying to see signs of the promised coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of things that we believe are going to happen and we try and keep our eyes on the news and we try and keep our eyes on what's going on to see if we can see things that sort of form a pattern. And one of the places that we're really interested in looking at seeing what's happening is Russia. We're always interested in what's happening in Russia. We're always looking out to see what's going on. We're always looking out to see how that might affect the geopolitical landscape of Europe. Okay, And one of the things that has happened in November of this year is that there's been a lot of things happening around Russia. So there's been a lot of things happening in the news around Russia, even most recently this week, about Russian troop build-ups in and near the Ukraine. Okay, one that might have slipped our attention recently is something that's going on in Belarus. Okay, so this is from the, the start of this month and it's, it's part of a whole series of things that's been going on. We've just isolated one incident out to, to have a look at tonight. So there's some tensions on the border of Russia, and especially where Russia borders a third party country, which then borders the EU. Okay, we've got a picture there of the president of Belarus, 
Levshenko, I think his name is, and Vladimir Putin. Now, it so happens that Levshenko is a pretty good friend of Vladimir Putin, and this is sort of feeding into what we're going to have a look at tonight. So there's this, there's this tension that's going on. Now, the actual headline that we're going to speak about and, and, and go, go a little bit further and extra extrapolate down is that there was actually, and I apologise for the people who can't read this online, um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll read it out. It says that Russia sent two nuclear-capable strategic bombers on a training mission over Belarus for the second day in a row in support of an ally admit, amid a dispute over migration at EU borders with Poland and Lithuania. Okay, so Poland and Lithuania both very close to a very large country, a very, very powerful country in Germany. So Germany is the very large country in the EU and they're sort of the buffer between what's happening in the very far east and effectively the migration into the EU from the eastern side of the world. And it so well happens that Russia, still being a friend of Belarus, has actually started to do some training exercises with the Belarus army, in this case a... Um, a relatively old bomber, who's over 50, there's probably a couple of us here over 50. This plane was first debuted back over 50 years ago now. It went for a little fly over Belarus. And the, the takeout here is it wasn't just the fact that there was this old bomber that went past, because this, this is quite an old bomber, this is, this is you know, historical, this is from the 60s, the late 60s. It's actually that they've started to remake this. They've actually started and gone through the technical exercise of building up their industrial capacity to the, to the point where we, they can make titanium bombers like this once again. So there's a lot of advanced technology that goes into a plane like this. And Russia has got themselves back into a point where they can remake this, this aircraft. Okay, so there's a lot of, lot of things involved in that. And that's really interesting to us because it shows Russia is actually investing in their military and their industrial capacity to start building things, tried and true platforms that they know. So they didn't go out and redevelop an F-35 plane at the cost of billions of dollars. They re-engineered something they already knew, but with more advanced technology. So that's really interesting to us because we expect Russia to be a very powerful nation when Lord Jesus Christ returns to this earth. So what's actually happening? Why, why, why is this even important? Why is it even newsworthy? Well, we can see Poland, Poland there on the left and Belarus there on the right, quite close to Germany. Germany being in the, in the top left, not not up towards Sweden, but the top left of the, the country there. So it's right on the border of Germany. It's really a buffer between, between you know, the rest of the country. And you know, the Germans and the Russians have fought through that area, each other, many, many times in the past. And what's actually happening is that there are thousands and thousands of migrants from all over the world, but some very specific places that we'll look at, that are actually being invited into Belarus with you know, easy visa applications, relatively cheap flights from the rest of, from the rest of what we're gonna see is the Middle East. And then they're being funneled directly to the border of um, Belarus and Poland. Now, none of these migrants particularly wanna to go to Poland. That's not where they're interested in going. They're interested in going to Germany, they're interested in going to France, and they're especially interested in getting across the English Channel to the UK. And Belarus, being a very good friend of Russia, is not stopping these migrants from going through. And we're going to have a look at one possible reason that that might be the case. So what's actually, what's actually going on? Who's involved? Well, there's an enormous jump in migration from the Middle East. People leaving Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, a lot of these places that have had some significant troubles in the past and heading towards, heading towards Europe. Now, there was formerly a way to get into Europe through Turkey. That was pretty much shut down quite a while ago. We remember people trying to get through. And now there's a new place that everyone's trying to get through. They've worked out that they can get into Belarus and the Belarusian government will effectively assist them, or it certainly won't stop them, from heading their way towards Poland. Now, this is a nice and attractive offer and there, obviously that, that chart there had a few thousand people on it. There's more than a few thousand people as the photos will attest to. There are thousands of people and they're being funneled towards the border of the European Union. Now, the, the European Union, I'll, I'll just go back and I'll just read a statement from, from um, Lashenko himself. He, he said it was possible that his country had helped migrants into the EU, but he denies inviting them to Belarus. So if they happen to get here, 
it's possible that I'm helping them to try and get into the EU. So that's a pretty bold statement from a, from a leader who isn't too worried about upsetting the EU and wants to keep, um, to keep Russia happy. You know, he's obviously, he's obviously very concerned that he might draw Russia into a conflict with the EU. He doesn't, he doesn't want that. He's not a madman. He actually says that. He says, I'm not a madman, but we might be using our military to sort of help them towards the border. That might be happening. Um, we're sort of saying, yes, that is actually happening. It's actually possible in his words. So he's, he's insisting that migrants are arriving in Belarus legally, and then he's also legally helping them to the border, which is fine. He's allowed to do that, legally helping them to the border. And... Um, yeah, the, Russia is actually praising them for their humanitarian handling of all these, all these migrants. They're very responsible handling of the whole situation. So there is people stacked up along the border in tent cities on the border to Poland and the Polish um, armed forces are taking this very, very seriously. There's thousands of people trying to cross the border actively and there's hundreds and hundreds of videos on YouTube of people attacking these border defences, helicopters flying around all the time and this is all happening right now. Not something that we hear reported on a lot, but it's happening right now. Now, why is it happening? What's, what's, what, why would this be happening? Well, Russia is bringing a bit of pressure to bear on the EU. Belarus isn't very happy because they have, they're under sanction at the moment from the EU for various things that happened early in the year. Mr. Putin apparently has been, um, he's been accused of being the main orchestrator of the crisis. In fact, the White House recently called, him, called on him and his influence over Mr. Lushenko to actually cease its callous exploitation and coercion of vulnerable people. So basically stop inviting these vulnerable people into your country and pushing them towards the EU. And the European Commission has gone as far as accusing Belarus of lying to migrants, luring them into Minsk with the, with the, the direct um, promise of entry into the EU. Come to us, we'll help you into the EU. And the idea is that now they're going to step up sanctions again against Belarus um, for, for ex escalating this migrant crisis. So a lot of people have commented, especially in Europe, in Europe, that this is actually a hybrid war. This is a type of war that they're facing with countries outside of the EU where they're being sort of, they're being attacked in a, in a different sort of non-direct, non-military way. So tensions in this area are rising fast and this is one of the signs of the times that we look at and go, there's something happening here. We should be ready for when Christ returns. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I don't know if you want to stay up here for a right of reply. It's up to you. <laughs> just, uh, just noting there is, we are fairly limited for time, but there is an opportunity, as we mentioned, just to provide any feedback on for Caleb for his presentation, or perhaps even just comments about what you know has been presented, which is very interesting, as, as you say, not necessarily very well presented um, subject in the, in the media at the moment. So I've got the microphone here. So for those watching at home, it would be great if you could just stick your hand up and I'll, I'll pass you the mic so they can hear as well. Did he? I can repeat the question as well. Oh, that even, makes it, that, that makes, makes it easier. easier. Yeah, sure. No, nope. very good. <laughs> well, good. Who's, who's up next, Alistair? Yep, very good. of what Taylor and I are going to do. Uh, our presentation tonight is on conscientious objection. And so we want to do it in the, in the style of a Larry King interview. So um, that's going to make it probably a little bit easier when we, um, we have to edit. 
And uh, so that, yeah, that's that's basically the the format. So Taylor will be interviewing <coughs> me. Uh, we will be a little bit tied to our notes for tonight, but uh, nonetheless, you should get some sort of an idea. Hi, Andrew. Uh, thanks for being on Bible Questions and Answers. Uh, for the next few minutes, I want to quickly discuss conscientious objection from the Bible's point of view. But first, can you explain what a conscientious objector is? Um, well, thanks very much, Taylor. Um, let's look at conscientious objection from the point of view of war as, as the Bible sees it. Um, a conscientious objector is a person who, on, on moral grounds, using scripture as their basis, refuses to fight and uh, or kill in wartime or have any anything to do with the war effort. Uh, a conscientious objector believes that taking uh, a human life is wrong, even uh, in self-defence, so um, or even in what is often called a, a just war by the press. So, um, conscientious objection is not cowardice either. It's not rebellion um, against government authority. Most conscientious objectors simply do not believe that they are um, that they personally can or or should take a life or do harm to anyone, even to defend themselves. So, conscious, a conscientious objection is a Christian belief? Uh, no, not, not at all, Taylor. Um, a person may be a conscientious objector and, and not be a Christian. Um, some objectors base their belief that people are good and therefore should be able to peaceably, um, peaceably resolve conflicts. Some follow the examples of uh, pacifist leaders like Gandhi and, and Bertrand Russell, while some conscientious objectors refuse to participate in war um, based on their hatred of, of the government and its control over, over citizens. For them, war is just uh, an, an organised violence and they don't want to have anything to do with it. So, Andrew, you base your conscientious, conscientious objection on the Bible. How so? Well, that's right. My... My opposition to, uh, to participating in war is based solely on scripture and the teachings of Jesus. Jesus teaches that his followers must renounce all physical violence. Um, such as when Jesus was uh, betrayed by Judas, uh, re record in Matthew chapter 26, he brings some soldiers along to arrest him. And we read in that where it says, and one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. And then Jesus also said to his followers in, in Luke, he said, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. So from, from the word that we have here of Scripture, these words of Christ are not exactly of someone who wants his followers to go to war. What about the wars fought in the Old Testament? Did not God approve of these? Uh, for example... I quote Deuteronomy uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 2. When the Lord your God delivers the Canaanites over you, you shall conquer them and utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them, nor show mercy to them. Well, yes, this may seem um, contradictory, such as the way that God interacts with, uh, with ancient Israel compared to the way that Jesus spoke and taught his, uh, his disciples. They seem to be quite different. But what we've got to consider here, Taylor, is that God's plan was to bring his people Israel into the promised land and to establish his kingdom there and remove all of the stumbling blocks that were before his, the children of Israel that could distract them from worshipping him and his way. And that's why God said to them, They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods it will surely be a snare or which is a trap to you okay 
<clears throat> let's make this relevant to us today. Let's say we are under attack from a foreign nation who invaded Australia, uh, Melbourne in particular. Some, str some stray enemy soldiers enter your home and want to do harm to your wife and children. What do you do? Do you pick up a weapon and fight them off? Well, this is an age old question and it's designed to try and uh, catch a conscientious objector out by playing on their inbuilt um, emotional desire to protect their family. But if you will, Taylor, I would like to answer this question by posing one to you. Is that, uh, is that all right for you? Sure, no problem, go ahead. Okay. Okay, we are in the Second World War, so we've got to go back in time to the Second World War, and you are part of a special squad that has infiltrated Hitler's bunker and come across plans that will enable Winston Churchill to strategize and ultimately win the war. And the intel is vital in saving hundreds of thousands of lives. Soldiers, whether they be English or German, um, citizens of both, both countries, you know, the elderly, women and children. And your squad manages to get back to London and deliver the Nazi plans to Churchill in his bunker. Unfortunately, however, you are captured by the infiltrating Nazi Einstein squad, who are part of the Schuffstaffel, which is better known as the SS. And they're primarily a death squad, you know, who are who parachuted into London and they're looking for your team. And once they had you, they found in your on your person a letter from your beloved wife that had your address on it, and they then take you to that to home. And so with your family tied up, you have no way of escaping. They place your wife and children up against the lounge um, wall and the Schutzstaffel with their submachine guns cocked, ready to be fired, and they're aiming it at your family. And they ask you for the location of Churchill's bunker so that they can then relay that information to the, the air squadron they have ready and waiting in France to be able to come and bomb the bunker. Now, if you refuse, they are going to kill everything that is important to you in your life. Everything that you love, they will kill. What do you do? Well, I'll guess I let them kill my family for the sake of winning the war. Really? Well, with that as your answer, I also would do no harm and react in a violent way against the uh, soldiers who have uh, got my family and are threatening me. But if I did, if I did fight back, this doesn't make the principles of Jesus wrong or conscientious objection wrong. What it means is that I just didn't have the, um, the strength to uphold what my belief was in that time. So as a conscientious objector, I am so, I am because of the example of Jesus and for the glory of God. And as the book of Matthew says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so that would finish off um, the video. Any questions, suggestions? I'm a little bit deaf though, I might not hear your suggestions too well.
Yeah, that's that's correct. And and same with the children of Israel. When they were commanded by God to go and wipe out a nation, they did so. Um, but when they went against God and still went to fight, then they suffered. But they were they they, they certainly weren't pacifists, uh, particularly back back then. And when Christ tells us to stand up and fight, we will fight because it's for a righteous cause. Okay. Thank you, brothers, for that. That was uh, really good. I'm looking forward to uh, filming that one. I really like the example as well around the SS. It's a good way to put it, and lots of detail there as well. Um, now, thank you very much for that. I'll ask uh, now Pete to come forward and, and give us his remarks. Facing the right way. Is that all right? All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Brother Alistair. I've just got a, a few short words to share with you all. Um, I'd like to talk about today the simple word, good. I'd like to talk about how it's used in the Bible and how we as individuals and as a community can be impacted by the message that it carries with it. Nowadays, we live in a fast-paced society and mankind is constantly striving to achieve bigger and greater things, aren't they? But the concept of good seems rather underwhelming may be unimportant to a lot of people in comparison. At least that's the humanistic point of view. But I'd like to give you a more spiritual point of view which comes from the Word of God. In the Bible, the word good has a significant place and it is often used in relation to the character of God himself, the Creator. The Apostle John, if you've got your Bible handy, the Apostle John wrote in his third epistle some really interesting words in verse 11 of the third epistle of John. It says this, Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. So it makes us think, in order for us to have an appreciation for how good God really is, well then we must understand who he is. This God of the Bible is also the God of the nation of Israel. So I'd like us to go back to the Old Testament and to look at some of the words of one of Israel's kings, King David. If you have your Bible open, turn to the book of Psalms. And I'd like to read some words that David wrote in Psalm 100. David has a lot to say about God, about his God in the Psalms. A lot to say about how he sees who God is. Look at Psalm 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good, his mercy endureth, so his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. So we see here this simple, yet I think profound statement The Lord is good. This is a declaration 
designed to capture the reader's attention. You see, at the time of David's writing, there were many different religions, many different beliefs in all sorts of gods and superstitions. But you see, the subject of these superstitions or the stories about these other gods portrayed them to be unstable, unpredictable, unfaithful and often even selfish. These gods, they were seldom kind and they were seldom good. But David is telling us that his God, the God of Israel, is different. He stands apart from all the others. But why is God good? Well, David gives us the answer to that too. In the rest of that verse, verse 5, he tells us that the Lord's mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. So firstly, we are told that God's love and mercy towards his people has no end. And secondly, God's truth or his faithfulness is enduring. In other words, God is trustworthy and he keeps his promises. That's why he's good. So this means that the word good is connected closely to the character of our Father in heaven. This is what the Bible teaches, that his character is full of love, mercy and faithfulness. And in the New Testament, we read of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And this same description of being good can be passed along to Jesus because he has such a similar character to his Father in heaven. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10 and verse 11, Jesus says, I am the Good Shepherd. So then, if we believe that God is good, and he is faithful to his people, then what responsibility does that leave us with? Well, the book of Micah has some interesting words. The prophet tells us that if we are a believer, that God has shown us something special. It tells us, in Micah 6 verse 8, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? So our calling then is to try in our own lives to be good, just as God is good, just as his son Jesus, the good shepherd, is good. We must follow him. Jesus declared in his life the goodness of the character of his father. And that is our goal as well, as followers of him. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Thanks. Any questions? Thanks, Pete. Looks like you got off scot-free. Well done. Um, I should just also mention that actually all the speakers have uh, come up with their own topics. So I'm actually in as much as in the dark on most of these as you all are, which is fantastic. I get to find out what these brothers have come up with. So thank you to all of them to come up with their topics tonight. Uh, it's been very interesting so far. We're looking forward now to the last secret surprise. Uh, Luke, if you can forward. Thank you.
it may just take me a minute to get the uh, technology set up. So, uh, wait a moment, please. You are pushed in line. Do you, um, do you have a disk up? Doesn't want to research. There we go, all ready. Thanks everybody. Um, we may have heard or even uttered phrases along the lines of, we need to focus more on health and well-being," or I'm concerned for someone's well-being." So in a few minutes, I'd like to explore well-being a little more and also help us to understand how it's described and also its importance to us based on the Bible. So there's various aspects that will contribute to and impact our well-being. And that can be both internal and external, whether it's the environment, our health, relationships, security, purpose, the community or communities that we are a part of. And included in these will be situations and scenarios that we face and they might be unique. There could also be decisions that we make that are unique to us. Things like moving across a country to live in a city that gains the world record for how long it locks down. Now, all of these aspects can help us to feel comfortable, healthy and happy. And that applies both physically and mentally as well. But those different elements can do the opposite, can't they? They can impact things so we're uncomfortable, we're unhealthy, and we are unhappy. And if we drew that, we would see that if everything's going fine, then we're at the high end. Otherwise, we're down the bottom at the low end. So we've got these high and low levels of well-being. Now, if you were to look at any kind of uh, books or literature or research on it, if you're up the high end, you're flourishing. But if you're at the low end, you're languishing. Languishing has become the real buzzword for how people feel, not just 2020, but also 2021 as well. Just languishing. And these are all important because, particularly at the lower end of the spectrum, the impacts of languishing can over a long period affect our health, our self-esteem, our relationships and those connections that we have with others. So we think there are some things that can help our well-being and I want to particularly focus on our mental well-being. What are some of the things we might consider that would be helpful for us? Well, give me the coffee in the morning or something else. It, it could be drink, it could be food something which can kick up our mood and, and help us uh, feel a bit better. It might also involve looking at what others are doing, looking over the fence, seeing where the grass is greener, and maybe that's something that's going to make things better. 
we might also feel it's beneficial when we have these horrible feelings building up to shout or to vent or to otherwise get things out. That might be verbal, it could also be physical as well. I'm not looking generally at this group, but maybe they're a little more prone to getting physical when things don't really work. It can then extend, sadly, via social media to these people, keyboard warriors, who, with swift and ill-considered communication, can very quickly reach levels of abuse and trolling, which are now becoming growing issues in society. But none of these are actual real fixes. They don't help our well-being. What actually helps, based on observations and research, is understanding what really gives joy and happiness, where that really comes from. Learning something new, getting involved in something that you haven't been involved with before, which can then extend to, well, I've set myself a goal and then I'm going to try and meet that. I'm going to do something to my skateboard or to my bike. I'm going to build something. Doing those things can really help your mindset. Thinking about others and not so much about yourself. Simple things like saying thank you and showing gratitude to others, including within your families and the things that uh, might happen within your household. Asking for feedback and trying to work out where are those things in which you can develop and grow. Thinking about how you might be able to make a difference to someone else. Maybe spending some other time reflecting on what really has meaning. And maybe that includes asking those really big and important questions. What does life really mean? And finally, using a, a little description from the Psalms, taking those selah moments. Selah is a Hebrew word which means pause and consider. It's another way of describing how we might meditate on those really godly things. So they are the things that actually help in contrast to what we naturally think might help. Now, a lot of what I've been um, considering and, and included in here really came up for me earlier this year where I had to prepare for uh, a spiel at my mother's funeral. And I found it really comforting, given the challenges she had in life, thinking about the examples in scripture of those who are at that bottom end, those who languished, those who had really big challenges and struggles. And I think it's such a beautiful thing to find that the Bible is not all fluffy rabbits and teddy bears when it comes to the people involved. You get a genuine insight into the good, the faithful, the righteous, and those at the opposite end of the spectrum. And when you consider some of these examples, they are just extraordinary. Those who languished included King David, who said in the Psalms that he was overwhelmed by guilt and the burden was heavy. And he questioned why his soul was so downcast. That was the level of pressure that he felt. Elijah is someone else who might naturally spring to mind, who said to God, I've had enough, take my life. He's essentially said to God, kill me. I don't want to go on. Jonah, who ran away from doing what God asked him to do, said, O oh Lord, take away my life. It's better for me to die than to live. Joe, who was an extraordinary example of patience, said that he had no peace, no quietness, no rest, there was only turmoil, and that he loathed his very life. And you'd think, wow, that's, that's pretty powerful from those people in the Old Testament as well. Do you know what was most reassuring to me about those who would languish? The Lord Jesus Christ felt that as well. Because he said that his soul was deeply grieved to the point of death. And he was under such pressure that it showed itself physically. You don't get sweat that looks like drops of blood through any normal situation. 
That only comes about medically when you are under extraordinary distress. And that was our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in studies about well-being, there's particular traits that are unhelpful in workplaces. And it's interesting to consider some of these things from a spiritual perspective, not just what might happen at work. And it really had me thinking about how I look at myself and others around me as well. Because the example that was given is around perfectionism and how when we're doing a job or trying to achieve something, we might have a really high standard we're working to. We want to deliver something that's really high quality. But what that can do over time when it starts becoming very behavioural is you just keep trying to meet these really high standards. And you keep doing that because if you don't, you'll get criticised. So you can start to see this little slippery slope that, that may occur. You can then have feelings of being under pressure or it's really difficult to slow down. It can be that feeling of I'm on a treadmill, I can only run at speed 10 and someone's flicked it onto speed 15 and all I can do is try and keep my feet going. There's then a level of criticality towards yourself that becomes um, hyper strong and that can then extend to other people as well. And you start projecting that onto what others should be doing or shouldn't be doing. And the impacts and impairments of these things are many. They will cause your pleasure, relaxation, health, self-esteem, sense of accomplishment and your relationships to start diminishing and to be damaged. Now, in the workplace, this cycle then just keeps perpetuating and all you start seeing in front of you is the lights that say, work harder, work harder, work harder, and you just get stuck on that treadmill. And that can also happen spiritually, can't it? When you don't take those moments, those sila moments, to pause and to consider. So what is it that God has to say about some of these things? What guidance and instruction do we have from the Bible um, on things like perfectionism and when we're feeling like we're nowhere near flourishing? Just three verses on each of those. So if we happen to feel that our expectations of others are starting to get higher and higher, and we feel like people just keep failing and they keep making mistakes. Can't they pick up their game, lift their socks, whatever it is? Sometimes we need that reality check that Paul describes that we all fall short and we're all in the same boat. And that because of that, Paul also says, God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye but you don't see the plank in your own eye? And there's no mistake around what Jesus is describing as far as a speck that you can hardly see on your finger versus a plank. And then when we are languishing, what are the things that we might be reassured by? Firstly, the Lord Jesus Christ wants us to go to him, to go to his Father, to be relieved of those burdens that are really heavy and to find rest in what they can give. God also described how we should cast all our cares. Different translations say anxiety instead of cares because our Heavenly Father cares for us. And finally... And this is perhaps one of the more inspirational verses I found on this topic. If you're feeling down, just consider what is expressed in Isaiah. Fear not, says the Lord, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. He reinforces that three times over, that he has us. In his hand. So when we think about the well-being topic that is um, very current at the moment, let's also think about some of the instruction that we have through the scripture on that as well.
Thank you. I won't run from the lectern. Alistair is waiting with the microphone in keen anticipation of someone wanting to say something. I don't want to ever set this up and no one use it. That'd be so disappointing. I know. This must be how Oprah feels. Just waiting for the crowd. Thank you. Uh, thank you on behalf of everyone here, Luke, and, and all your speakers tonight. I know it is a bit intimidating to perhaps speak up in front of everyone here, but I just ask if we could all please, we've had four different speakers on four very different topics. After class, if you could take a moment to go up and just pick one of them and perhaps provide some feedback, maybe positive reinforcements or just some thoughts, that'd be really appreciated so we can help just, uh, you know, have that interaction and also help these speakers going forward as well. So again, thank you for those brothers for that, that work tonight. Um, we'll wrap it up tonight. Just a few announcements before we go. Of course, just a, a reminder about the baptism. We're all looking forward to God willing this Sunday, oh, sorry, Saturday, 9 a.m. down on the peninsula. Uh, Amber, um, I don't know the details exact beach yet, but of course, let's keep a close eye on the WhatsApp or the email to see when that comes up. And as far as Wednesday night classes, next week we've got the last class of the year. And I believe off the top of my head, it's uh, Luke Lawson speaking on a wrap up for the year. So I hope that's right. I think that's right. Uh, anyway, we'll uh, close tonight with a, a prayer and then I believe there's some supper. I'll just ask Alex if he could come forward and close us off for tonight and offer thanks for the supper. Thank you. To our dearest Father in heaven, we come before you now with thankfulness in our hearts for this evening which we've been able to share together. We thank you for the words which we've heard this evening and we pray that the, the words which we've heard might be wholly recept, uh, received by those who hear it. We pray that this message might go out and that it might draw more people towards your word, towards your son and towards you, dear Father. Because we see in the world around us that things are changing very quickly and the return of your son could be so, so close. And so we pray that we might use this time to be a light in this world and to spread your message of hope. And so we thank you again for this opportunity and we pray that we conti may continue to be able to meet. We also thank you now, dear Father, for the food you've provided for us. You leave nothing you leave us in want of nothing and you provide for all our needs and for that we are so thankful. And so we leave all things in your care and we pray earnestly for the return of your dear son. And it is through his name we pray now, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.